Um, hi, I'm Melissa Addy. Um, I'm going to talk you a little bit through um, how I see storytelling working for your businesses. Um, and before I do that, I will just quickly tell you a bit about me so you know why I should be here talking to you. I spent 15 years in business, so I was mostly in retail developing new products and new packaging at Sainsbury's head office. Uh, and then along the way, I did a, a master's in business innovation. And then I moved away from that, and I went into mentoring entrepreneurs. And I spent six years mentoring entrepreneurs, which was really fun. Um, and I must have met more than 500 <laughs> over that time and spent time hearing their stories and seeing what made them interesting, what made them innovative, so that uh, I could pass on uh, government grants that were available at the time. Uh, then in 2015, I became a full-time author. I became the writer in residence here at the British Library, which is enormous fun. At the moment, I'm doing a PhD in creative writing. Um, and I self-published, so uh, that, that should actually be updated. I'm now up to nine books. <laughs> I'm just cranking them out. And um, the, so these are, this is the kind of historical fiction I do. This is a book that I'm, I'm basing this talk on today. It's called The Storytelling Entrepreneur. Um, and at the end of this talk, I will give you a, a link where you can go and get a copy for free. Um, so this is a little bit about why I feel um, that storytelling is, is really important. I'm going to go through why it matters, storytelling. Uh, five ways in which you can use stories. That's what we're going to focus on. I'm going to give you a kind of introduction to a concept called the sacred bundle. Um, and that is, is kind of an introduction because I can't go through the whole process with you today, but you will find the whole process in the book. And it's an invitation to really go through that and find your own ways of storytelling. I'm going to go through some no-nos for storytelling. We'll do a little bit of a Q&A, and I do recommend that you fill in your uh, feedback forms. They're really useful to us. So stories, why? should you couch, if you like, your communications in storytelling mode. So there are some reasons for this. If you want a wonderful book, it's called Story Proof, and it has tons and tons of examples of why it's so important. But there's three key things that really matter to businesses and organizations generally. The first is that it, re it allows people to remember information a lot better than without a storytelling shape around it. And this is why people can sit down and tell you the last 10 years worth of EastEnders plots uh, with no hesitation whatsoever if they're big fans, because they are embedded in a story format for them. Whereas if you take somebody and you give them a whole ton of information, it's very hard for them to hold on to more than a certain amount if it isn't within some kind of a structure. And we really respond to stories as humans. Um, it creates a sense of involvement and community. So if you're trying to engage with customers, if you're trying to engage with the people who use your business or your organization, it's really important that in, in creating that sense of we are sharing stories together, you will get a, a much tighter sense of engagement and involvement with them. And finally, it creates a lot of motivation and enthusiasm for learning. So if you are trying to train people, it's a lot easier to uh, couch your training in terms of stories for an audience to grab hold of and remember that information and learn what it is you're trying to teach them. So these are three reasons why it's really important for you to think about how you could use storytelling. So I'm going to go through five different ways in which you can tell stories. And some of these are for the business, for the organization going outwards, and some of them are for going inwards into the organization for how you think about your business and how you think about the life that you're leading around that. So first of all, selling your products, obviously, or your services. Um, this is because customers love to know how something happens, how something gets made. And so it's a lot easier if you have two products which are more or less the same, roughly the same price, and one of them's got a great story, you're going to gravitate to the one with the great story. You just are. Because it is a natural thing to be curious about how something comes to life and how it's made. And the thing is that having met 500-odd entrepreneurs, the number of people who think their product or service is unique and special and whatever, and I say, mm, honestly, in all those years, it's probably about 10% that I felt were really different. And the rest of them, I could think of another product or service that was pretty similar. And so what made them stand out was actually how they did business and how those products were made, how those services came about. It was not really the actual product or service itself that made it special. So these are some of the things that you can think about sharing. You can say who you are. 
because people actually like knowing about the people behind the business. If you're an entrepreneur, this is really easy because usually the story of a person, the entrepreneur themselves, is a bigger part of that business itself. So they're all intertwined together. So it's quite easy for you to create that story. How the product is made in detail, where it's made, if that is irrelevant to it. Um, why it's different to another similar product, not in terms of, oh, we're so much better and whatever, but we take this kind of care of it. We select things like this. We chose to do it because of X. What you can do with it. So uh, I remember meeting a company who made uh, a kind of a balsamic vinegar. And I just sort of thought, yeah, salads, I suppose. <laughs> that was about as far as I got with thinking about it. And then I looked on the back of their bottle and they'd listed tons of things you could do with it. Really weird stuff you could do. Put it in cocktails, put it over ice cream, all sorts of stuff. And I thought this is great because you are actually changing the perception of what that product does by suggesting all these different things that people can do with it. Um, where the idea for it came from, this is something that's, that's important to know for people. And what your values are as a company, as an organization. So you can share that information on packaging, on the website, on the email, on your social media, all these. Any time that you are communicating, you can try and share some of this information. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this. So this is Glasses Direct. Uh, and the founder of Glasses Direct, you want to go on their website and have a look at their story because it's great. He uh, was a young man who wore glasses and he was quite shocked at how expensive they were. So he started asking, what is, what is the actual cost price of the glasses? And it seemed like no one wanted to say. <laughs> and the more he pushed, the more people didn't want to say. And in the end, he found out that they were really quite low. Uh, and he was quite shocked at the difference that he was being asked to pay versus what the cost price was. And so he went out and created Glasses Direct, which still exists. Um, it's now a multi-million pound business. He started it from his bedroom uh, in his parents' house. Um, and he... When you read the story, it's all about his journey of self-discovery, his journey of this quest for finding the information and then setting up the business. And now he sells glasses direct online uh, and they're a lot, lot cheaper. Um, if you wear glasses, it's definitely worth uh, having a look at them. Um, this one is Yo Valley, so this is their butter. And you can see already that they are sharing a whole lot of information. They've got Yo Valley and then it says Family Farm. And it says proper organic British butter, churned from the cream of British family farms. So this concept of family and farms is coming across over and over again, just in the packaging. They've already told you a whole lot of stuff about themselves there. This one I really like because this is a Pret napkin and they are sharing some of their values. They are saying that they would rather give the fresh food to the hungry than sell it the next day when it's not so fresh. They would rather take that food that's still fresh that day and give it to homeless people than they would hold on to it for the next day and sell it to you. Um, and you can see that on here, not only have they given you what it is they're doing, they say it's the right thing to do. They are emphasizing that value again. And by the way, they've also added in something else about themselves, about it being recyclable. So again, they're sharing another piece of values with you. And this is just a napkin. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of communications, but they are using it to tell you their values. And this one I just really like because it has this thing of these watches are waterproof. So instead of saying the watch is waterproof, they've put it in a pouch of water, uh, which is probably a huge waste of packaging and money on the packaging, but it tells the story so well. They don't even have to say anything. You're just going to go, oh my God, that watch is in water. Um, so just having that is a fantastic way of telling your story without words. So these are just little examples of how you can see people sharing information and stories that are going to make you want to buy those products. So the second thing you can do with storytelling is engaging your customers. And this is a two-way street. You don't just tell your story and tell your story and tell your story. You say, what's your story? Tell me your story back. And this is where if you ask your customers for their story and share their stories, customers love it. They love to be recognized. They love to share their stories back with you. So these are some of the things that you can do. What you're doing with them there is you are connecting with them because when you sit around the fire and you tell stories, you don't just have one person go on and on and on and on with their stories. Someone else has a go. So that's one thing. And the other thing is you learn about them. So then you can meet their needs better. 
So these are a few things. You can set up a survey and ask them things about products, about packaging, about what you do as a company. You can ask for their testimonials and print them on packaging. And this is a very positive and very powerful thing to do, and I will show you in a minute. You can run a competition to name a product after one of your customers. Be careful a little bit, because we all know what happened with the Boaty McBoatface. Um, you have to be prepared about what might come back at you, but it's an interesting idea. Ask things. Ask what product do you want me to do. Don't just go making the product that you think they might want. You ask them. They will tell you. Um, and if you are in contact with a customer, you always ask for their story. Try and get a story out of them so that you understand them better and you can share it. Here's some examples. So this is uh, a, a St. Helens farm. They do goat's milk. And they have these little testimonials on them. So they have often children. And they've got a whole talk. I was born with eczema. And they found out that I can't have uh, dairy products. I tried goat's milk and it helped. Blah, 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 blah. I want you to thank you. And this is from Eleanor. She's eight years old, four months and three days. Very specific. Um, but she is on the side of those milk uh, packets. And customers really like that. They like sharing their story and seeing it on your product because they, they feel seen and they feel heard. And you get to find out information about who's using these products and why. Um, Tesla are doing the same thing on their, uh, on their website. If you go on there, they have all different examples. They're trying to show off electric cars. And they will show a particular brand of car, a particular uh, model of the car. And then they will show uh, someone's adventure with that car. So they go family cars or couples cars or commuter cars or whatever it is they're trying to show. They have examples from their customers. This one I like because, because this requires very specific one-to-one -one you're working with the customer. But this was a massive global company figuring out how to make it feel like it was personal. It's a bit cheeky, really. But what they did was they just took the 100 most popular names, and they stuck them on bottles. And of course, people can't help it. They see their name, and they're like, oh, it's, it's my name. And, and I looked at that and went, oh my god. You just took the 100 most popular names and stuck it on there. But then I saw one that said Isabel, and I was about to have a baby, and I knew it was going to be called Isabel. And I was like, oh, but I want one. And I bought it. <laughs> I bought it. I couldn't help it. So when you see that, uh, they are tapping into that feeling and that desire for the story and for the link with you. I mean, they're doing it in a rather crass and commercial way, but they figured it out. They know what it does to people. And then this one is the kind of thing um, that if you go into uh, the Business and IP Center, you will see lots of stories about entrepreneurs, about how they have developed a product because something happened to them and they wanted to develop something that would help with that. And that always helps. It helps to understand where a product came from and how it came about. So these are examples of how you can uh, engage with the customers. Obviously, we all have this thing of we must communicate on social media. We must, we must. Um, I'm just going to give you some basic advice from having watched a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with what they feel is an obligatory use of social media. So first of all, I'm going to tell you, just pick two platforms and work on those until you've got the hang of those and that you can do them reliably and steadily and well. Uh, do not try and do every single platform all at the same time because you will do them badly and you will stop doing them regularly and regularity is everything in social media. Um, I mean, it is literally better to do a blog once a month for sure that is really good and people know they need to come back on whatever it is the first Sunday of the month to read your special blog than to go, what most people do is they write every day, every day, every day and then once a week, and then not for a month because something happened, and then, and then back to every day for three days. People don't know when to come back when you do that. The more steady you are, the better. So try and think what's a best fit for your company, for the kind of organization you are, also for what you like. <laughs> there are social platforms that you may just not get on with, uh, in which case don't try because you, you won't do it as well as a social platform that you will get on really well with. So here are, some, here are some things for communicating that on social media. Finding your tone of voice. Uh, and when I worked at Sainsbury's, we used to get out a Jamie Oliver recipe and a Delia Smith recipe when we were trying to explain tone of voice to new recruits. And we would read them out. It was the same kind of 
thing they were trying to make, pasta or whatever, something fairly simple. And just the tone of voice was so different that you could tell without being told which one it was that you were being read. And that was how we explained tone of voice to people. And you need to know what your tone of voice is and stay steady with that. Use a consistent approach. Um, and social media is a storytelling session in a group. So you need to be listening to other people as well as telling your story. Uh, and don't be fake about it. It is no good you maintaining some sort of pretend persona that you think fits the brand. It is better that the brand fits you and that it is a, 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 a truthful brand because it will be A, a lot easier to do uh, and B, it will be more authentic and people will feel that. Um, so let me show you a couple of examples that I like about uh, what happens when you do this. Uh, this is a friend of mine. He runs a, a gay B&B. &B. It's very kind of a high-end luxury B&B &B in Italy. Um, <clears throat> and he writes a blog. Now, usually the blog is all about the pools looking beautiful and we picked olives today and we've made an exquisite breakfast and it's all nice stuff. And then occasionally he goes off on a rant and it's usually about the internet connection or the bureaucracy or something and he goes absolutely nuts and writes all this really grumpy stuff. And at the beginning I used to read it and go, um, that's not very, um, it's not really in the tone of your rest of your stuff. But after a bit, when you read the blog, you kind of look forward to the rants. The rants are quite funny um, and, they, and they get more of a sense of him. You go, oh yeah, that's Alec again. He's off again on a rant. There he is. Um, so actually, it is more truthful. It is more real. You get a feeling of who he is uh, and you get a feeling of how he talks and how he behaves and what worries him in life. And it makes it more readable. It makes it much more interesting. Uh, this obviously is, a, is a, a good quote in terms of not thinking about calling it social media, but just being human and telling a story. And, and that's what we try for. This is, this is fun. This is innocent. They do this thing every year for charity where if you knit a little bobble hat, they will pay a certain amount towards a charity. And it's a very silly thing to do. And, and it looks weird in the shops. But actually, it's very memorable. And you start looking out for it. I collect them because they fit Barbie dolls heads um, and, <laughs> and my child likes them um, so they to just it's part of who they are it's part of their tone of voice which everybody tries to copy by the way which is a really bad idea do not try and copy a really well-known storytelling voice because all it sounds like is a cheap copy you just go oh, sounds like innocent <laughs> so all you're doing there is reminding people of innocent not your brand um, so if, if you're doing smoothies choose another tone of voice do something else this again is about uh, a, a bigger global corporation who have figured out this is going to be their tone of voice they're going to talk about different bodies uh, and they're going to say that all of them are perfect and all of them are lovely the way they are they're now locked into that this is their tone of voice. This is their values. They cannot now put a supermodel on there because that's not who they are. That is not who they are claiming to be. So when you have that storytelling mode, you need to stick with that and allow people to engage with that storytelling mode. So now I just want to talk a little bit about uh, a different kind of storytelling. So rather than telling the story for people out there, it's telling a story for you. Um, I think people get stuck on business plans because they haven't quite got the business vision right. And that is a story. So you need to write the story first, the business vision of where you are trying to get to and what you want out of this business or this organization before you write the business plan. Because if you write it and it's really compelling to you, actually writing the business plan becomes an awful lot easier because you're just writing how to get there. Okay, it's almost impossible to have a business plan of how to get somewhere if you don't know where the place we're trying to get to is. If I just say, I'll meet you up north uh, soon. Well, <laughs> Well, where's up north? Are we, are we talking like Milton Keynes or is it Scotland or I don't know, where are we going and when? When are we meeting? Where? And that's, you know, that's not specific enough. You can't work with that. You can't motivate yourself to get to somewhere that's badly uh, envisioned for yourself. So first of all, sit down and write yourself a story for you about what it's going to be like 
when you get to the place that you're trying to get to. You can create props. <laughs> you can have things on your desk, that are, you know, the Oscar that you're going to win at some point, that kind of thing. Um, and then you tell that story to stakeholders, to the people who are invested in your business. That's you, that's your employees, that's the people around that business or that organization so that they can help you make the story come true. Okay? It makes it so much easier for you. And so these are examples. You have things, you go, yes, she's going to be wearing my dress. Yes, I'm going to be a bestseller on Amazon. Yes, going to be winning all these gold medals. Yes, going to win the Oscar. Whatever it is that you want, you create the props that go with that and the story that goes with it so that you are in a position to create that reality. And this is something nobody ever likes covering. But no business is always successful. It just isn't. Uh, and so... There are times when you need to rethink what the story is. You need to look at the story you've been telling yourself because we all tell stories about who we are and what we're doing. And you need to consider whether it needs a bit of a change, whether it needs rewriting in some way. So one of them is to think, is it a moment of trial? Because every good fairy story has a moment where it all goes wrong and you get tested in some way and you've got to come out of it better and bigger and all the rest of it. Uh, are you at a crossroads and you need to find a new direction? Is it time to accept help from others? And this one, importantly, number four is um, most entrepreneurs that I've worked with start off as just, just them. And as it gets bigger, the business, they have to at some point allow other people in. And they have this story they tell themselves that they are the lone entrepreneur. They are out there all on their own. This is their business. This is their baby. You can't keep telling that story if other people are going to be allowed in. Because what you will do is you will treat them like some sort of minor admin assistance where you micromanage their work, which I've seen a lot of, um, or you don't allow them to shape the story with you. And so it's really important when you're doing this, at some point you have to think, the story just changed. The people in it got bigger and there's a change there and I have to allow other people to shape the story with me. Okay? So it can be a moment of transformation, it can be a moment where you have a crossroads or a moment where you become part of a wider team and you need to allow that team to tell the story with you. So a couple of things about when you're shaping a story. Uh, a lot of people ask when you use a story, and you use a story when you need to make it real. You use beginning, middle, end. Use some stickies to help you uh, structure something that you can see how the story moves forwards. And the most important thing is, what do you want the audience to take away or do? Because that will inform how you tell that story. This, the hero's quest, is kind of the most popular storytelling shape. And if I asked you to write a story, it's probably the shape you would go to automatically without me telling you how it works. You would go to that story because this is the most common story that we tell. And there's the hero and there's a problem and they go on a quest and they face trials and tribulations. And in the end, they are successful. And this is a very common story in entrepreneurs uh, sort of mindsets about how they should be as an entrepreneur. But there's another story which I call The Gatherer's Tale, and that is about less about this big linear quest, and it's more about what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What is the detail of it, and what are the small parts of it, and the small values of it? And I think that that can also be a very interesting and very compelling story if you can get it right. If you can really focus down on the detail of what you do, it really matters to people. And it's worth thinking about engaging the senses as much as you can. So the other thing people worry about is where do you get the stories? Um, and over time, you kind of collect them. From the outside, there are various things that are sort of quick go-tos. So fairy tales, faith, if that matters to you and it matters to your audience, the news, celebrities are a very good shorthand. So you think back to the Jamie Oliver and Delia Smith thing I was doing, that's because it's very quick and easy to do. I don't have to sit there and explain complicated tones of voice to you. I just give you two examples of celebrities and you know what I'm talking about. 
um, ready-made things, so novels and films and TVs, you can say this story is a bit like that story. Uh, and other businesses, not in terms of aren't they awful and we're brilliant, <laughs> but they did this and we do it this other way. Not necessarily slagging them off, but showing how you are different. But then there's this lot, and I think these are more uh, authentic. So this is coming from inside, so from the teams and the individuals in your business, hearing their stories and seeing how they structure things, and from customers. But the other place that I think is a really good place to get um, stories from is your sacred bundle. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your sacred bundle, and I really, really, when you get the book that I give you the download for, I would really like you to take a little bit of time and go through and make your own sacred bundles. Okay, I've worked with a whole bunch of entrepreneurs here at the British Library on a one-to-one -one basis, and we created their sacred bundles. It was a fascinating experience. I had people laughing a lot and crying, which was a little bit disconcerting when you're working with someone on their business and they start crying. But uh, it was very interesting to do. So, sacred bundles are based on a Native American concept of uh, a tribe would have a sacred bundle and into this bundle they would put things that uh, recollected, that brought to mind important moments, important people, important values in their tribe's history. You didn't add to it all the time, you'd add to it very occasionally, and you would add to it with great ceremony. Um, and if you saw it as an outsider, it would mean nothing to you. It would be not pretty stuff. It would be a bunch of scraps and odds and ends and broken things and weird stuff, and you'd think, I don't know what this is, a bundle of rubbish. But to that tribe, it would be everything. It would be an incredibly important thing to have and a place to store all of um, their stories and their values, okay? Uh, and now this sounds terrifically new age, and uh, but these are some of the organizations that are using sacred bundles. And I can tell you when I work with entrepreneurs that it is a fascinating process to go through. And I'm just gonna talk you through a few of them to explain to you what a bundle can do. So we had uh, an organization called Desi Doll. They have uh, beautiful little uh, dolls uh, who have uh, Islamic um, elements of play in them. So they teach you certain words, they teach you certain values, um, really lovely interactive dolls. Now, when we did this uh, with the owner of Desi Doll, uh, we discovered after a while that family was pushing up enormously in her sacred bundle and it kept coming up and we had pictures of her family and things inside the sacred bundle. And we realized that actually it was because the business was shaped around the lifestyle that she wanted. She wanted time with her family. She wanted to prioritize her family above the business. And so the business was not designed to go big like that. She didn't push it really hard. She could have done, but she held back from doing that and she let it grow in a very slow and very organic way. And that is not because she wasn't ambitious. It's because it was about the lifestyle that she wanted. And so the sacred bundle, when we were going through that, really made her focus on, oh, that's why I'm making certain business decisions. It's because this was the lifestyle that I chose, and that's why I created this business. It's really good for pointing the way to your USP. So there's a company called Empatica. They do uh, furniture, wooden furniture, uh, from renewable resources. This guy, when he was a little boy, uh, was very into the whole concept of the Amazon jungle. He thought it was fascinating. Someone told him about it. And then, of course, they had to tell him that things were not great in the Amazon jungle and that it was getting chopped down and all the rest of it. And he felt really badly about this, even as a child. This was a really upsetting thing to him. He used to play in the woods near his house. And the more we had this conversation, the more we were talking about this um, sacred bundle and you do a whole talk and questions, what have you, and you're picking objects out that are representing certain things. And the more we had this conversation, the more it kept coming out about how important it was to him, uh, the woods and the Amazon and the sense of, of oneness with that. He even, after a bit, I kind of looked at his um, watch. It was made out of wood, which I've never seen before. 
And I just went, oh my God, Tristan, like it's all the way through you. It's just everything shows up against this. And so because he already knew that this was part of his USP, but when we'd finished making that sacred bundle and he had refocused on how important these elements were to him, he went away and built it even more into the business. So he got to the business so that it did things like it would plant a tree every time that somebody placed an order for, um, for furniture with him and things like that. So it made him refocus on his USP. Um, the bundle itself, once you've made it, can be used as a pitching tool. So a um, company called Oyo who make uh, uh, water bottles that scrunch down when you've used them. Um, he had a whole, uh, he created his sacred bundle into the shape of a snakes and ladders board to show the journey that he'd been on, which was really fun. Um, and he used it when he pitched. So every time he went to outside investors, he'd get out this snakes and ladders board and do a whole pitch around that. It can indicate who would be good customers for you. So there's a company called Squid. They do uh, umbrellas and other wet gear that change color in the rain. And they were inspired by Jackson Pollock. And therefore, they thought museums, art galleries. And sure enough, <laughs> museums and art galleries are their biggest, biggest sellers of their products. Um, it helps you share core values with new employees. So the Tangle Teasers, the hairbrushes. Um, they, the, the founder is a hairdresser and everyone who comes new into the company, he gives them a haircut on day one, whether you want it or not. Um, but for him, he is literally, slightly weird having your boss do your hair, but anyway, he literally is kind of shaping you into the Tangle Teaser family and he's in touch with you quite literally uh, and sharing his knowledge and his expertise and why he created that product. It could become a book with which you can communicate. A lot of entrepreneurs with whom I've spoken have used the information that's come out of those sacred bundles to then create books um, that communicate their story. It can reinvigorate core values. So track surveys, uh, uh, do software, and they, they were one of the only people I spoke with who included their whole team in creating the sacred bundle. A lot of the other entrepreneurs were doing the, it's my story, and they were very much focused on their part of, of the story with the business. Track surveys included the whole team doing it, and it really refocused them on, we believe in being a team. We believe in having that team conversation together. It can remind you of what made you happy. And this happens sometimes with businesses. They're doing really great, it's all going well, but there are things that have dropped out along the way that used to make them happy about the business. Uh, and so a woman called Upcycleist, she does uh, beautiful, takes um, old uh, furniture and upcycles it. And she used to really enjoy having a very personal connection with the people she was making products for because it was a very one-to-one -one experience. I mean, she used to take the thing round to their house and they would say, we're going to put it here. And she would put it there and decide on a name for it and all sorts of stuff. And she kind of missed that personal connection. And so she went out of her way to find a situation where she could reconnect in that way. And she ended up doing workshops where she taught people how to do what she does. Um, it can be material for social media. So once you've gone through, the social, um, through your sacred bundle and you found really interesting things, it can be a wonderful use um, into social media. So Vaughan Memorials uh, do gravestones. Um, and they did... Uh, a fun, they had, uh, when I said to them, what sort of things are we going to be putting in this sacred bundle? They had amazing things. They had uh, f old photographs of when it was all horses and plumes and carriages and it wasn't um, uh, motor vehicles at all because they'd be going 200 years. Uh, and so they had fantastic stories and they had fantastic images that they could use. It also helps when you're creating new products and sub-brands because you have to go back to the original story and go, does it fit? Does this story for this new product, does it fit into the big story? And sometimes you see companies where they try and do uh, a new story and it doesn't quite fit. And you can see what they're trying to do with it. I don't know if anyone's seen the new Kellogg's cereals, but they make me laugh the packaging because they've got, you know what Kellogg's packaging looks like. They have sort of taken that and changed it quite a lot. And they've gone back to their original founder's name and they've changed the logo, and that the, you just wouldn't know other than the name. 
that it's a Kellogg's product. And that's really interesting to me because basically what they figured out is that the story that they tell, the story that is in people's minds when they think of Kellogg's does not go with healthy cereal. So they've tried to shift the story <laughs> by going back to their roots and going, oh no, but there's another story over here, which I actually think is a, it's a good idea, but it doesn't really work because what it makes you think is, you got you figured out that the story doesn't work this product doesn't go with the story that we've got in our mind so now you're trying to create a new story that still doesn't fit with the original one that we've got over here but it's a really interesting example of someone trying very hard to work with the story and change it just a few things about no no's <laughs> um if you're going to make a big fuss and go, yeah, we're going to be really into storytelling and we're going to commit to this and yes, everybody get on board with the storytelling, you've got to follow it through. You cannot just then dump it because otherwise it just becomes some sort of fad you had in your mind. Don't pick PR pretty stories, okay? They need to be authentic stories. So I had a woman and she said, um, <clears throat> the reason I started my business was because my husband cheated on me and then he left me and I had to pick up the pieces, and I don't want him in my sacred bundle. And I said, yeah, but sacred bundles are not pretty. They are not pretty, they are truthful. And so when you're a big deal and you're gonna give money to charity from your business, you tell me what charity you're gonna choose. You're gonna choose something pretty with kittens and stuff because it looks cute, or you're gonna choose women whose husbands dumped them and had to pick up the pieces, because that would be the real story. These two kind of go together. Don't go overly slick on presentation and don't over rehearse. So my favorite story around this is I was watching Sport Relief and they had Claire Balding. She was talking about children um, in Africa are lying, sleeping on the streets. Very rough life and they were very little children. And my husband and I are lying in a nice cozy bed with our two children next door. It's all nice and warm and cozy and we're watching this thing and we're going, oh, it's really bad, really bad. And she's telling all this stuff very slick, very well rehearsed, very well presented. She's saying all the statistics about it and how many children there are and how bad it is and all of this. And we're going, yeah, it's really bad, really bad. But we're kind of getting frozen up because there's too many children and you're just thinking, well, I don't know what to do about this many thousands of children. I don't know what to do. And you're getting frozen up from it. And the story was just too slick and too much to cope with. And then this was really interesting to me. Her voice cracked and she went off the rehearsed speech and she said something very sort of clumsy along the lines of, these are not bad children, they could be your children. And she said it really clumsily and it was awkwardly phrased and she sounded like she was about to cry. And my husband and I, we went like that and we both picked up our phones without looking at each other and we both made a donation. And it was because this was just too slick. It was too much and it was too slick. And she went from that to something very real and very felt and off script and badly phrased, but it got through. So it's really worth, I think people sometimes overdo this. They over prepare and then it just comes across as slick and people can't engage with it. So sometimes go clumsy with it, with the stories. Try to avoid a culture of horror stories because it just gets more and more and more. And then people go, yes, yes, I've got a horrible story as well. And it's kind of too much. And this is part of this. If you're going to share bad stuff, say what you learned from it and then do something with that and then stop. Do not just go on and on and on with the bad stories. This is a really important thing <clears throat> that I want to leave with you, which is think about the story the world is telling you. And I have watched so many entrepreneurs now and they have this story in their head. It's sort of the Richard Branson story, which is you start small and thing, and then you grow and you become a multimillionaire and it goes global. And it's all, it's a very specific story. And you get all these entrepreneurs who feel that they must stick to that story. They must keep going in that track. And actually some entrepreneurs don't want to do that. They wanted a little business that fitted around their lifestyle, that allowed them to do certain things, and they don't necessarily want to follow that story. But the story is so strong for them from the world that they kind of get sucked into it, and they forget that, no, that's not the story they wanted. And so it's really important not to always listen to the story that the world is telling you you ought to be telling yourself, and instead to write your own story. And I think that's a really important thing for you to think about. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you.